All right, let's wrap up chapter 14 in this um, video. Uh, the data here shows various professional occupations and the light blue bars tell us the percentage of that occupation that were women um, in the year 2014. And then the darker blue bars tell us the percentage of new graduates, right, getting a, an education, getting licensed in these professions as of 2012. Well, if you're getting a larger number for new graduates than currently occupies that occupation, you would expect the percentage of women in these occupations to grow. And that's the case for each of them. You know, let's just look at dentistry as one example. In 2012, or I'm sorry, in 2014, about 29% of dentists were women. But in 2012, 46% of new graduates from dental schools were women. That means that we would expect over time this number to go up. We would expect a larger fraction of dentists to be women over time. And that's true for each of these. So this just highlights how we can look at the fraction of new graduates entering an occupation to get a sense of what proportion of that occupation uh, women will make up in the future. And it's very clear that women are making up a larger proportion than they used to in the past in these professional occupations. Another way of putting this would be our occupational segregation index should go down over time as we see these graduation rates exceed the percentage represented in each occupation. Now let's talk about the different opinions on gender inequality. We know, for example, that on average women make 80% of what men make. We know that even though unemployment rates are similar for men and women, we don't see inequality there. We do see women often crowded into feminine occupations uh, disproportionately to men being crowded into masculine occupations. We can look at these wage differences and occupational differences in two ways. Uh, one would be rational choice theory. And this just says that women choose different labor market behaviors than men do. Much like women in the product market are more likely to buy high-heeled shoes than men, and men are more likely to buy steel-toed boots than women, so you get this disproportionate participation in markets. Um, the rational choice theory would contend the same thing in labor markets. Women are more attracted to jobs like elementary school teaching and nursing, and men are more attracted to jobs like construction and mining, and therefore they make different choices and you get different outcomes. The jobs themselves have different compensation and as a result, women may make less than men. One example of this would be men are attracted to jobs that pay a compensating wage differential because of the higher probability of death and the more laborious type of um, environment, whereas women might take jobs that pay less but are more comfortable and are often providing uh, fringe benefits like life insurance and health insurance and paid leave and those types of things. The rational choice model would assume that women are being compensated but in a non-wage form, whereas men are being compensated for the lack of fringe benefits and other amenities in wage form. You can read the examples here to get a sense of how a rational choice uh, model would interpret women making less than men. But let's move on to the discriminatory market theory. This says that women are actually discriminated against in the marketplace. They don't choose to be elementary school teachers and nurses. Discrimination pushes them, segregates them into those occupations. Um, they don't choose to take fringe benefits over wages, but they're forced to and pushed into occupations that pay less money and provide more um, paid time off and fringe benefits and so forth. So the, the discriminatory market theory is effectively saying that women are not making these choices. Now, I want to remind you, we're using men and women here, but the rational choice theory and discriminatory market theory would apply to other types of discrimination as well. As well. You know, are blacks choosing uh, lower paying occupations relative to whites? Um, 
that type of thing. But let's stick with the gender differences, and you can see, you can read these yourselves, but uh, here's kind of an example of how a discriminatory market theorist would analyze um, the differences between men and women. Now, I want to also mention that the real world is probably a mix of, of both of these. You know, I, I know it, it sounds uh, kind of cliche to just say, well, everything is in the middle. But the truth is that um, there are certain occupations that women are more likely to choose than men. We see that and vice versa. And there have been clear discriminatory elements of labor markets uh, in the past and uh, today that still exist. So realistically, we probably want to think of a spectrum here with rational choice on one end and discrimination on the other end, and we're somewhere in the middle um, or somewhere in between at any given point in time. All right, let's wrap up with the major anti-discrimination laws. We do use government to address a lot of these discrimination problems. It's incomplete. Uh, government is one means of remedying this. Uh, there's other means too. There's cultural change, there's education, right? And um, there's also uh, just the punitive elements of the market for discrimination. Remember we talked about how a discriminator may suffer consequences in profits and in terms of output if they choose to discriminate. So a lot of forces can counter discrimination, but legal ones have uh, been used quite widely at the federal, the state, and even the, the local municipal level. Let's take a look at the big ones. So the Equal Pay Act of 1963, this one outlawed any wage discrimination between men and women in the same job. Simply put, if it's the same job, men have to be paid the same as women. Now, that's adjusting for things like experience and education and so forth. Uh, but if all else is equal, then you can't pay women less than men. There is a loophole here. Uh, firms could get around this law by creating separate jobs. If they say that a job is different and they usher women towards the lower paying job, then they can legitimately pay women less than men. But Again, the job, if it's perceived as the same, if they're doing the same work, it'd be a hard loophole to create. You really need to create a different job for women. And that is one of the problems because if you look at, for example, a woman that goes to work for a construction company, well, maybe the woman is perfectly willing to work in the uh, physical construction of a building, but she gets ushered into a receptionist position. So she ends up making less than if she did the actual physical construction. She's being segregated um, as a result of her gender. So that would be legal. The segregation might be a problem, but it wouldn't violate the Equal Pay Act because she's a receptionist. She's going to make less than the construction workers because they're in different jobs. The problem is that she would have been willing to do the higher paying job, but wasn't given that opportunity. Another example of the anti-discrimination legislation is the Civil Rights Act of 1964. This is the big one, right? This is the one that we still talk about today. Uh, it outlawed both wage and employment discrimination based on these uh, categories, race, gender, color, religion, and national origin. I think this act is more telling in what it doesn't include because those are going to be bones of contention in the future. One example would be there is no protection in this act for sexual orientation. And states have um, adapted to that by creating their own legislation that bans uh, discrimination based on sexual orientation, but there is no federal protection in this particular act. But there is for these other things. And I also want to remind you that it, this would not be a violation, I, I should say discrimination would not be a violation in any of these areas if they were relevant for the position. Remember we talked about previously hiring a priest for a Catholic church, you could discriminate based on the religion of that priest. If the priest is Muslim, you don't have to hire them as a um, Catholic priest. But that would be a non, that would be a relevant characteristic. And so it wouldn't be subject to the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Just like if you were hiring our Italian actor, right? Um, you could say, well, he's got to be male and he's got to be white, Italian. Um, therefore, you could you would not be violating the Civil Rights Act of 1964 because those would be relevant characteristics. Okay, This applies to all private employers, labor unions, and governments. Effectively, it applies to just about everyone. And then there's the executive orders. These come directly from the president, whereas these two come from Congress. Um, executive orders are unique because they only they can be um, removed by subsequent presidents because they are 
um, uh, the executive at that time. But a lot of these are still around. They haven't been reneged upon. Uh, 1965 to 1968, we get uh, an executive order that prohibits federal contractors from discriminating against workers on the basis of race, gender, color, religion, and national origin. So it's specifically targeting federal contractors. If you, if you get hired by the federal government, if your company wins a bid to do work for the federal government, you cannot discriminate based on these factors. Okay. And then um, it requires affirmative action programs for firms that underuse women and minorities. Affirmative action is where you, a firm is required to hire certain disenfranchised groups of the past, like women and minorities, in order to um, comply. And very controversial programs because it, you know, it is a form of discrimination. Some would say reverse discrimination, but it's deemed by many as rectifying those past imbalances. So forcing firms to hire a certain proportion of women or minorities to maybe bring those ratios up to uh, levels that are more comparable to the general population um, is often a uh, correction for um, the underlying discriminatory environment these people operate in. All right, so that's it for this chapter. Um, a very interesting subject. I would encourage you to maybe research some of these things a little bit more. Uh, they're not topics that will go away. They'll always be um, discussed because discrimination is a concern to most people. It's just a matter of how we deal with it and how we remedy it. All right, guys, if you have questions, let me know. Thanks.